Bizrat Hashem, the goal of this is to demystify psychopharmacology. So uh, we're kind of set up right now with an impossible task. And that impossible task goes like this. Uh, what we're going to try and do in about 50 minutes is to teach a semester-long uh, graduate level course on psychopharmacology to psychotherapists, but we'll do our best to condense it into about uh, 50 minutes. Okay, with that involved, uh, again, I've given out a little handout, and I'm reading off of that handout myself. Uh, last time I was by uh, Rav Orlowek Shlita, he told me never ever lecture off of notes because it's a nonverbal communication that you have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, the issue here, though, is that uh, I want to make sure that I touch on everything, and I want to make sure that you have mastery of everything when you're done here. So it's not that I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, good. Let's get started. General rules for therapists. Uh, what I can tell you is that we are a team. And I know that Dr. Flashman and other good psychiatrists will certainly tell you, you know more about your patients than I do. You've met them more times. You've spent more times with them. I'm just some guy who they came to my office one time. If I don't have the information that you have about your patients, I won't be able to do a very good job. Because psychiatry is a very gray science at times. It's not like we can go ahead and do an x-ray, we can go ahead and do a colonoscopy and see, ah, there it is. If I don't have the information that you have, I'm not going to be able to help your patient to help themselves. So when I say we're a team, I mean the best thing that you can do to help psychopharmacology work is to go ahead and speak with the prescriber. Whoever is prescribing the medication for your patients, it is incumbent upon you to have an open relationship with them and to have a good back and forth dialogue to understand what's going on with this patient. If we are not a team, also, we won't do very well because the truth is, as a psychiatrist, I have the same goal as the therapist. My goal is to make sure that the patient lives a happy and a healthy life and is successful in achieving their goals. If I am at odds with the therapist, 99% of the time it's because there's a lack of communication. And if I was to sit down with the therapist, I would hear things that I didn't know. And I would imagine that the therapist would hear things that they didn't know and we would be able to go ahead and put our noggins together for the sake of our patient to make sure that they got the care that they needed. We have to be honest. That means that when a patient asks you a question and you don't know the information, you say, I don't know the information. That's a great question to ask your psychiatrist. If you feel also like the psychiatrist has not made the right decision, go ahead and tell the psychiatrist, I feel like you've not made the right decision and it's because of X, Y, and Z. Because the truth is, if the psychiatrist hears X, Y, and Z are happening, they might want to change the plan. These are very important things. And with that, let's also talk about the don'ts. What you should not do is tell your patient to stop their medicine. What you should not do is tell your patient to change their medicine. What you should not do is tell your patient to skip their appointments. What you should do is tell your patient to discuss with the doctor any questions they have and let your patient know that you as the therapist are communicating with the doctor in order to advocate for your patient's needs. These are very, very important fundamental principles because in the end, we all decided that accounting was boring. We wanted to help people and that's why we're here. And the best way to help people is to work as a team. What we're gonna do now is we're going to run through a lot of different drugs, classes, and just try and have a basic understanding of what's out there. So again, classes of drugs, names of drugs, benefits of drugs, side effects of drugs, let's start with the ones that are prescribed most commonly. In the States, about 30% of women aged 20 to 60 have been prescribed an SSRI at one time. An SSRI is the basic antidepressant that we all know about. 
This is Prozac, Flutine, Ciprolex, Sertraline, Zoloft, all of these medications. What does an SSRI do? Well, it S's the S in the RI. Uh, so by increasing the amount of serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter in between the synapse, it helps with conditions that are thought to have an underlying deficiency in serotonin, specifically anxiety disorders, specifically depressive disorders. SSRIs are quite effective in dealing with these issues. So what I will say about SSRIs is that they are not cure-alls. Yes, there was a book that was called Listening to Prozac that made it seem like Prozac was so good that it should be in the water. But what we know is that even fluoride doesn't necessarily have to be in the water if you're willing to go see Dr. Abramson, Stern, Prenzlau, or anybody else good who has a dental office in the area. We know that there are benefits and risks to treatment with SSRIs and that they only work if patients take them as directed. And furthermore, SSRIs uh, are most effective in patients with more severe illness. For patients with limited dysfunction, SSRIs are not that effective. What should you know about a patient who's being treated with an SSRI? You should know that SSRIs do not work immediately. Most of the time, a patient will have to start with a lower dose. That dose will be increased over the course of a few weeks. And that after somewhere between three to six weeks, there should be a slight change. The full change, though, might not come until after a few months. Furthermore, it's important to note that SSRIs, as well as anything else, psychopharmacology-wise, many times is just a part of the treatment. The truth is, is that therapy, something that all of you do, is very, very important. Exercise, sleep hygiene, good, happy, and healthy diet, not using drugs, decreasing stress, are also part of the picture. And for somebody to go ahead and to tell their patient, all you need to do is take a bit of Prozac and you'll feel better, that is not helpful advice. When a patient is told, as part of your treatment plan, Prozac might be helpful in conquering your anxiety, depression, OCD, trauma, that is a helpful statement. What are the side effects of SSRIs? The main ones, besides the 5,000 that you'll read if you Google Prozac, Sertraline, and Ciprolex, are stomach problems. One in three people will have a bit of stomach problems. Maybe they'll feel like they want to throw up. Maybe they'll have to run to the bathroom a bit faster in the morning. I generally advise people to go ahead and to take it with food or without food, whichever makes your stomach feel better. And I let them know that within a week or so, most of the time, that feeling goes away. About one in four people will have notable sexual side effects. This is more important in men. We don't need to have a discussion about why that is, but it is also important in females. Uh, if your patient is experiencing sexual side effects from taking an SSRI, this is a very important thing for them to discuss with their doctor, because based on how a person uh, takes this medicine, it can be easy to avoid these side effects with some simple uh, switches in the way that it's taken, especially in the firm community. Take it in the morning on the day uh, of the mikvah instead of by nighttime, things like that. We'll talk about it. Okay. One in a hundred people who takes an SSRI uh, will have a bad reaction. This is where the black box warning for suicidality comes in. Uh, also, people will essentially have a manic flip. So somebody who has bipolar disorder and takes these, somebody who has psychosis and takes these, is at a great risk uh, of developing a bad, bad reaction with a ton of energy, not wanting to sleep, talking fast, feeling out of control, 
grandiose ideas, spending, traveling to Las Vegas, or a lot, uh, we know that this is mostly in people who don't have a pure depression or a pure anxiety. This is more in people who have a more complicated medical illness, specifically something like bipolar disorder. That being said, it's important to go ahead and to have this discussion with the psychiatrist as a therapist. If your patient, you believe, has bipolar disorder, it's important to communicate that with the psychiatrist. That way, when the patient shows up and says, I'm feeling depressed, which they very well might be, that the patient will not be prescribed an antidepressant, specifically an SSRI in some cases. There are other antidepressants out there, although most of us will see patients who are treated almost exclusively with SSRIs, there's also bupropion, which is Welbutrin. This is a medication that's also FDA approved for the treatment of ADHD. This is a medication that has theoretically less sexual side effects. This is a medication that increases energy for patients that feel kind of sluggish. And this is a medication uh, that can be a good choice for folks that have a mix of depression and ADHD. Theoretically, Welbutrin will increase anxiety, so it might not be a good choice for folks who have an anxiety disorder. And it's important to note that Welbutrin will not be a good medication for folks who have an eating disorder. It's important to note that Welbutrin does increase blood pressure in many patients, and it's important to note that some people will snort it if they're in the ages of about 15 to 25. What else is out there as far as antidepressants is concerned? There's mirtazapine, which in the States is called Remeron, and here it's called Miro. This is a very good medication for certain types of patients. For older folks who aren't eating so much, who aren't sleeping so much, this is a great medication. For younger folks who are already eating a lot and sleeping too much, this is a terrible medication. That's because the main side effects are that it makes people tired and hungry. That being said, for many patients who have a tough time regulating their sleep cycle, this can be a great medication in the beginning. Trazodone is another medication that puts people to sleep, and there are tricyclic antidepressants out there, amitriptyline, clomipramine. These are medications that sometimes are used because they facilitate uh, also treating chronic pain conditions. There's also Cymbalta and Venla, Venlafaxine, which are a bit more complicated medications because they work both on serotonin and norepinephrine. A lot of times, though, these are effective medications for patients that have chronic pain problems, that have substance abuse problems. What else is out there? Another big class of psychopharmacologic agents is mood stabilizers. The most common one is lithium. Lithium is the best medication. The only problem is that eventually it fries people's kidneys, thyroid, and a lot of other stuff. For a patient who is compliant, it is a great idea because they have to do blood tests and it's easy for a psychiatrist who takes a chryas for their patients to make sure that the patient is taking it correctly and ensuring that there's a lower risk of side effects by measuring the functioning of various organs. Lithium is a great antidepressant in bipolar disorder. It's a great anti-manic drug in mania. But again, it's a bit complicated because the blood levels have to be calculated. It's specifically complicated in the firm belt at this time of year because, let's do the Socratic method for one sec, who wants to be a hero? Why is lithium difficult at this time of year? That, who said it? Because people who fast, their lithium levels shoot up very high and they can have acute problems. Sometimes a patient who takes lithium, who doesn't eat or drink for a day, can have serious kidney problems. When their level goes up, they might start vomiting, they might have seizures. It's very important if you're a therapist and have a patient who has bipolar disorder and is taking lithium, to ensure that they talk about it with their doctor and plan out what to do on tinnitus, in addition to talking about it with their Rebbe, of course, in order to obtain a heter when necessary. What are the other medications in the mood stabilizer class? 
There are anti-epileptic drugs, specifically lamotrigine, carbamazepine, and Depilept, Depicote, Valproate. Uh, the anti-epileptic drugs. So these are medications that were originally created for people with seizure disorders. These medications do a very good job of making people tired and of stopping mania, but they don't do such a good job of stopping depression in many cases. These are also drugs that have blood levels that have to be measured, and it's a bit of a challenge. These are also drugs that in many female patients won't work too well because they have teratogenic effects, so they can cause birth defects. That being said, it's always a discussion of mylas and chasronas, and a good doc from the psychiatry field and a good doc from the OBGYN field could have a good team discussion about how to support a patient and better understand the mylas and chasronas. Antipsychotics are another class of medicine. And there are old-fashioned antipsychotics and newer antipsychotics. We'll talk about the newer antipsychotics first because the newer antipsychotics also are called mood stabilizers. For example, Aripli, Aripiprazole, Latuda, Lorazidone, Seroquel, Quetiapine. These are all medications that can be used in bipolar disorder. Zyprexa, Olanzapine, Risperidone, in vagus systema. These are all medications that do a very good job of treating mania because they make people tired. They make people tired and then they sleep more and they get better when they have bipolar disorder. These drugs also have challenges with them. In many people, specifically probably uh, a third to a fifth, I'm sorry, a third to half, there's big weight gain. There's big cholesterol problems. There's big risk of diabetes. These labs need to be drawn, but it's not as frequent as with some of the other medications. So for many people, these are easier medications to use. There's no blood levels to be taken for them, and that is very reassuring. As a class, all of the antipsychotics, again, make people tired, and all of the antipsychotics cause what are called extrapyramidal symptoms. EPS. That's Parkinsonism, rigidity. It's akathisia, which is some folks will want to pace up and down the halls like they have ants in their pants or spilkies. It's very important to note that these are cumulative side effects and that these things get worse with time. A good doctor will be measuring for these at every visit, and if you start to notice a change in the movements or in the facial expressions of your patient and they're taking an antipsychotic medication, it's important to bring it up with the doctor. The old-fashioned antipsychotics are very numerous and there's a few that we'll probably see in our practices. There's Haldol, there's Perfenon, there's Thorazine. These are medications that you'll see frequently prescribed to your patients. These will be prescribed mostly for schizophrenia, and they work well for treating delusions and hallucinations. Unfortunately, they don't work so well for motivation, and there's an idea that the newer medications might work better. It's important to touch on clozapine, which is a different type of antipsychotic medication. Clozapine is a miracle drug for some people, for other people, it just makes them obese and potentially kills them. So it's always a question of mylas and chesronas. Clozapine uh, is a medication that requires extensive monitoring that should only be done in a clozapine clinic, uh, a Lepinex clinic, uh, for example, uh, like at Shimon Chacham, uh, or by a private doc who does this very frequently. For folks who have not responded to other antipsychotic treatment with schizophrenia, this drug can be a lifesaver. Not only does it decrease uh, the positive symptoms of psychosis, delusions, paranoia, and hallucinations, but it can also be quite effective in giving people fescite again for the first time in their life. For somebody who doesn't move, who doesn't want to get out of bed, who has no motivation, who doesn't have any interest in connecting, with their family, clozapine can give those people 
a shot in the arm and help them to do what they need to do to get their life back. About one in three people will have some terrible side effect of clozapine and will have to stop it, whether that's weight gain, blood clots, stomach problems, horrendous drooling, uh, or a blood allergy whereby they have to stop the medicine immediately because it becomes potentially fatal in 1% of people. Clozapine can be a miracle drug for many people. In about a third of them, uh, they will do better than with other antipsychotics. And in the final third, these people will wake up. So a bucher who hasn't said a word in six months can go back to being a relatively functional individual. He might not be the same way he was five years ago, but he should be able to get through the day. There are people who take clozapine who have gotten PhDs. There are people who take clozapine that have went on to successfully raise a family and be normal uh, functioning members of the community. What else is out there as far as psychopharmacology is concerned? Well, there are stimulants. And if you have a child, then you have somebody in your family that's taking stimulants because we're all from here and it's Israel. No smiles means that you hate that. And I agree, and Dr. Flashman also hates that. So this is a major problem, and we don't really have the time to discuss the cultural issues associated with the fact that people think stimulants are miracle drugs. But we all know what stimulants are. There are some that are shorter acting, like Ritalin, and some that are longer acting, like Concerta. Stimulants will increase attention. We know that stimulants will increase attention because they were created a long time ago for fighter pilots that were running the bombing circle from America to Russia back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s because caffeine wasn't good enough to keep people up and a fighter pilot doesn't have a place to go to the bathroom after they've had 10 cups of coffee. Stimulants were also good at keeping people focused and awake. So. If you are a fighter pilot, you do not have ADHD by definition, and yet this still helps you to stay focused and awake, which suggests that just because a stimulant works for you doesn't mean that you have ADHD. What stimulants will reliably do is increase heart rate, decrease appetite, cause sleep problems, and decrease the growth curve in a developing child. These are predictable side effects and should be measured. And stimulants are always a benefits and risk discussion. Is it worthwhile to try this? Is it not worthwhile to try this? Is it worthwhile to try it and then to continue it if there are side effects? Is it not worthwhile to try it and continue it if there are side effects? If there is an ASCON who told your kids that they should take stimulants, you should see a doctor. If you saw that doctor for less than half an hour, they should not be a doctor. Good audience. What else is out there? Well, there's atomoxetine, which is Stratera. This is a medication that works on norepinephrine. It's FDA approved for anxiety disorders and for ADHD. It is weaker than a stimulant, but it's gentler on the system. There is a rash that comes with it. It can increase uh, your uh, blood pressure. But this is something that many people might want to recommend their patients discuss with a psychiatrist if a patient is unable to take stimulants for various reasons. There are benzodiazepines, which are also a, a wicked big problem. Benzodiazepines are Ativan, Clonopin, Clonazepam, Clonix, Valium. These are medications that work incredibly well on the GABA receptor which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. When a person takes this, they will automatically feel like they just had a shot of high quality whiskey, a glass of nice wine, or their favorite Sam Adams seasonal brew. It works really well, which is why people inevitably want to take it more and more and more and more. So benzodiazepines are great short-term solutions for somebody who's having terrible panic attacks 
for somebody who's acutely manic or psychotic and needs to sleep, for somebody who's acutely agitated, benzodiazepines can be a lifesaver for these patients, but they are not good long-term solutions. They reliably cause tolerance and withdrawal, so when people are taking them, they'll need to take more over time to get the same effect. When people are taking them and stop them, they will feel anxious, agitated, and potentially develop seizures, depending how much they're taking. This is a major problem as well. In older patients who take Clonix, they're at risk of falling, which is more dangerous for a woman above the age of 55, a fall or a heart attack? I set that one up, a fall. The mortality is greater for a woman above the age of 50 from a fall than for a heart attack. So we have to realize that these medications impede cognition, cause sedation, and also cause falls. What else is out there? Well, there's a bunch of wacky stuff, like vitamins and homeopathic stuff. And if you want to throw away your money and go to a homeopathic doc and encourage them to do usser things within the frim belt, you're welcome to. But if you're interested in taking that homeopathic doc to base in or to a secular court for making false promises, you'll win. And I'll be happy to testify that there's no basis for this. And there's also no basis in halacha for tricking people into thinking that homeopathic medicine does anything. And I'm happy to go ahead and have a long discussion with anybody about this because it's nezek l'ravim. But some vitamins are cool and some supplements are cool too, like fish oil. Omega-3 fatty acids work pretty good in some people. It's not a lifesaver, but for some women who are pregnant, omega-3 fatty acids are protective against postpartum depression. For some people, omega-3 fatty acids can be helpful. They're an adjunctive treatment, meaning it's a secondary thing to use, or a tertiary or a quaternary thing to use. It's not the primary treatment. There are things like valerian root that will help people get to sleep, but we always have to be careful when we're using supplements. And the reason that we have to be careful with supplements is you have no idea what you're getting because it's not regulated by anybody. There's just some cool guy who's from Queens and used to be a hippie who's giving it to you. That being said, if it's an old Taimani lady, you should go for it. It's very important to keep this stuff in mind because your patients will come to you and ask you, what do you think about this? And you should know that the placebo response is fantastic. Placebo response is also called in Yiddish, trach good b'tzayn good, or trach shov tov tov. If somebody believes something's going to work, it's going to work. If somebody thinks something's not going to work, it's not going to work. So when you hear that 500 people got their necks broken by a chiropractor and somehow it cured their Crohn's disease or their schizophrenia, well, that probably didn't happen. But if you believe it's going to happen, the initial few weeks of placebo effect are pretty darn good. Is your husband a chiropractor? No. I just saw a face from somebody in the middle. Okay. If he is, I'm sure he's a good guy. What else is out there? ECT. Uh, we're going to have question time, I promise you. Uh, ECT, uh, shock therapy. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Uh, Kitty Dukakis, uh, electroconvulsive therapy, is a life-saving treatment for many people with severe depression, severe bipolar disorder. This is a life-saving treatment. It's very intense. It has a very bad rap. It requires generalized anesthesia. In this country, it essentially requires being in a hospital for multiple weeks but it is a life-saving treatment for treatment refractory and severe depression and bipolar disorder. ECT is a shock that causes a seizure that's done by a psychiatrist and an anesthesiologist together. And for people who can't take psychopharmacology, perhaps because they're older or pregnant, or perhaps because psychopharmacology didn't cut it, this is a life-saving treatment. In this country, I believe that it has to be approved by a special board that includes regulatory committees, but it is a life-saving treatment. And if there's a patient who's not getting better, it needs to be explored. 
ECT is not a treatment of borderline personality disorder. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind because many of the people who show up and ask for it do not have the kind of illness that will benefit from it. But for serious depression, bipolar disorder, and some kinds of schizophrenic symptoms, it is a life-saving treatment. TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, is something that's really cool, but it's not ready for prime time in most cases right now. Yes, it's FDA approved, it's very expensive, and it's probably not the answer for 95% of people. At some point in the future, it'll get better, and it might be a bigger answer, but for now, it's a great way to waste a lot of money. Okay. Have I been iconoclastic enough? Good. Let's talk about some, again, of the challenges with psychopharmacology. There are benefits and risks. The benefits are that hopefully, if it's used correctly, psychopharmacology will help some of your patients with some of their symptoms. To think that it will help all of your patients with all of your symptoms is what my sons would tell me, hypocerate. It's just not going to do that. It doesn't work that well. If it was that good, again, it would be in the drinking water. But it's not. So therefore, it doesn't work perfectly. That being said, some of your patients will be helped with some of their symptoms. And you should know, even if you're a CBT purist for OCD, that SSRIs, for example, will open up your patients' minds and allow them to do the necessary therapy work. SSRIs will allow your patients to show up for therapy sessions. So again, the benefits are there, and so are the risks. It's always a benefits-risk discussion, and it's important to note that once a patient takes a medicine, the most important risk for many of our cases is the risk of being a crazy person. Because once you've taken a medicine, you now feel like a crazy person. And it's part of our job as therapists encourage them to know that you're not a crazy person. You are a person with a brain disease that is taking a medicine similar to a person with epilepsy, similar to a person with multiple sclerosis. And if you encourage your patients to decrease that stigma, they'll be willing to take the necessary treatment. We have to go ahead and monitor for effects. Now that's my job, that's not yours. But if I haven't seen your patient in three months because they missed a few appointments and didn't follow up, and yet they're still taking their medicine, you should remind them to come see me, and you should feel free to say, have you seen Dr. Friedman in the past few months because he's supposed to take blood tests for you? And if you wrote down which medications require blood tests, you would know when it's important to send that patient back to me because they haven't been there in a while. You should also keep in mind that your patients will tell you, I started that medicine that Dr. Friedman gave me. And because I started it, now I'm feeling that I have terrible migraines every day. What you should not do is tell them to stop the medicine. What you should do is tell them to call me. Because people will do things unilaterally, and it only works if you're attacking a rack. Tough crowd. Glad I didn't invite my wife. Oh, there we go. Okay. She's a therapist. She's my therapist. Good. Now we're smiling. Okay. We also have to manage our patients' expectations. That involves reminding them how important it is to know that pills don't work immediately and that pills are part of the solution for many people. If they say, I've been taking Prozac for a week and I'm still depressed, the answer is, of course you are because it just doesn't work that fast. If they tell you, I've been taking this medicine and my marriage still stinks, of course it does, because this medicine doesn't fix marriages. If they tell you, I'm taking this medicine and I'm still afraid to go to work, the answer is, of course you are, because you work in Abu Tor. Let's now go ahead and talk about the individual conditions. Again, we're going to race through an entire semester. Each one of these is a lecture on its own. Treating depression. What is the standard treatment of depression? It's evidence-based psychotherapy. It's exercise. 
and its decreasing stress, decreasing substance abuse, and potentially antidepressants. When an antidepressant is used, it should be one of the standard ones. SSRIs are the most commonly used antidepressants because they have the least risk of side effects, and the side effects are more mild. And hasfashalam, if your patient takes 20 of them, they probably won't die. They'll just feel shaky for a day or two. So you start that with the psychiatrist, and you encourage them to see the psychiatrist three to four weeks later to follow up and see if the dose needs to be increased. If your patient is pregnant or lactating, the general advice of the American Psychiatric Association is that the benefits will outweigh the risks, because maternal bonding is important. And even if a bit of the chemical goes through into the milk or into the uterus, across the placenta, that the benefits outweigh the risk, because not nursing is not healthy. And not taking a medicine when a patient is depressed can result also in intrauterine growth restriction, in teratogenicity, and in early labor. It's very important that a patient not stop their meds when they become pregnant, but rather discuss it with their doctor. And there's the Merkaz Tetralogy, which is something that's funded by the Misrata Briut, where people can call up a number and find out evidence-based information about the medications that they take. In general, there are also certain medications that are much safer during pregnancy and lactation. Sertraline is a safer medication. Paxit, paroxetine, is a less safe medication. It's important to keep these things in mind and to work also through when working with a pregnant or a lactating patient that they should see a psychiatrist who feels comfortable treating this patient population and has expertise in psychopharmacology in this patient population. Treatment resistant depression. Again, if your patients aren't better, you can think about adding on other treatments. You can think about adding on lithium to an antidepressant. You can think about adding an antipsychotic. You can think about ECT. You can also just go back to the drawing board and say, is my patient depressed because they have clinical depression or do they have a drinking problem? Do they need to switch their job? Are they involved in a domestic violence relationship? Do they not have depression and rather have schizophrenia? Sometimes just going back to the drawing board is very important because it's, if it's not working, that might mean that we're not treating the correct illness. Treating anxiety the treatment of anxiety is cognitive behavioral therapy, exercise, and sleep. Depending on the situation, the treatment might also be an SSRI. Specifically, again, higher doses for things like OCD in cases of severe anxiety is very, very helpful. Some patients might need doses that are above the FDA-approved limit, but that's for docs like Professor Zohar. Nobody knows him. He's good, but he's also a cowboy. So, what do we need to know? Benzodiazepines are not a great idea for the long term. Patients with anxiety will take one milligram of Xanax. They'll take two milligrams of Xanax. They'll take four milligrams of Xanax five times a day. And before you know it, they're in a detox facility. These are not good long-term solutions. In some cases of specific types of anxiety, antipsychotics can be helpful, but that's beyond the scope of this lecture. Phobias, just because that's within the context of anxiety disorders. The treatment of arachnophobia is taking a tarantula and putting it on your forehead. Exposure, relapse prevention for everything. That's the way to do it. Treating bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder requires medicine. And the reason that bipolar disorder requires medicine is because it is a serious condition. Anybody who's ever treated a patient with bipolar disorder knows that this is the real deal. And it's not funny. For the 1 in 25, 1 in 30 people that have bipolar disorder, their life is destroyed when they have episodes. I have a patient who recently bought a digger 
and drove it into his neighbor's garage because he wanted to remodel it for him. Bipolar disorder will ruin a person's life. People will go to Las Vegas. People will go and do Vegas type things in Las Vegas that don't stay in Vegas. Okay, thanks, sorry. Um, it's very important to note that bipolar disorder requires medication in many cases. Some of these medications, the atypical antipsychotics, the antiepileptics, and lithium, have more significant side effects, but it's always a benefits and a risk discussion. Many times because these patients will require treatment in ongoing fashion, it's about picking the side effects that are tolerable to that individual because you can't always escape freely. So it's a question of what's more important to that individual. If they're a woman who's planning on having more children, it's important to pick a safer medication for pregnancy and lactation. If they're a professional athlete, it's important to pick one that's not going to put weight on them. If there's somebody who works the night shift, it's important to pick one that has less cognitive side effects and sedation. It's very important to know that in bipolar disorder, once a person's had one episode, their chance of having another episode is greater than 50%. Once a person's had two episodes, they're pretty much guaranteed to have a third. With this in mind, we always have to think about what is the lowest effective dose that a person can remain on to prevent further episodes, to take away a medication on a patient like this, to do what some people do when they say, I help my patients to get off of medications, is a reckless thing to do to a patient with bipolar disorder. Treating schizophrenia requires antipsychotics. But beyond requiring antipsychotics, it requires education because schizophrenia is the weirdest thing that exists in a human being. For the 1% of people who have psychotic symptoms, paranoia, delusions, hallucinations, it's so scary. And for the people around them, it's even scarier. For a person to think that they're the target of some malevolent scheme involving the KGB, life is horrifying. And for a nice from kid, to think that he's a Gilgul of Bilaam and has to suffer is completely life-changing. We have to keep in mind that antipsychotics will help people, but most patients with schizophrenia have a nosognosia, which means that they don't think that they have a problem and have limited insight into their illness. And it's a matter of finding a common ground between the family who understands why treatment is so important and between the patient and the treatment team. These are patients who need Sal Shikum and Betuach Lomi services. These are patients who need supportive living environments. These are patients who can return to the workforce, to yeshiva and a yeshiva shikumi, in a vocational setting with support when they have good treatment. I just got an email last night about a patient I'm married to a schizophrenia, and it's a big simcha. But the truth is, this was five years of touch and go, convincing the family that he wasn't a bad kid, convincing the kid that he wasn't a bad kid, and then convincing me that he would take his medicine on his own. The emphasis is that in schizophrenia, we have to work so hard as a team, and everybody has to buy in because it's such a big challenge. Antipsychotic medication, if it isn't working, thinking about clozapine, lepinex, and also keeping in mind that about a third of people in European countries will take their medication in the form of a shot, whether it's a risperidone shot, an Invega shot, a Haldol shot, an Ripley shot. For people that don't want to take their medicine, but will stop taking their medicine because they don't have a problem, it's so important to make sure that that fight over medicine happens once a month. And if the person can agree to take a shot once a month, now even once every three months with a new medication that's been approved, it can save a person's life, save a marriage, save a family. 
in patients who have schizophrenia, oftentimes they'll get bad medical care because the doctors don't care about them. And part of your job as a therapist is to keep in mind that your patient who has schizophrenia who smokes a pack of cigarettes a day that has a bad cough could have pneumonia. It's important to note that your patient who has schizophrenia that gained a lot of weight on Zyprexa needs to be checked for diabetes. It's important to note that nobody needs to take 500 different medications, no matter how complex their illness is. And if you see a patient taking lots of meds, which often happens in schizophrenia, it's okay to have a discussion with their doctor and say, you know, I once came to a lecture where somebody said there's really no reason for anybody to be on more than 17 medications at a time. Substance abuse disorders. The treatment of substance abuse disorders is Reb Gershon. Sorry. Anyways, he does a good job. The treatment of substance abuse disorders is sobriety. It's giving people meaning in their life because when they stop drinking and using, they have no meaning. There's a giant void. And that's where stuff like AA comes in. That's where stuff like smart recovery comes in. That's where stuff like volunteering comes in for a good chesed organization. That's where serious physical education comes in and a person can go run a marathon or do a triathlon. The treatment of substance abuse disorders for patients who are unreliable is regular drug testing to ensure that they're reliable and we're focusing on objective things and not our own subjective hopes and dreams. How can you tell if a person who has substance abuse disorder is lying to you? Yeah, so I heard at least seven people say their lips are moving. And that's the correct answer. So knowing that we see a negative drug test is the only way to know that they're sober. There are some really cool things that can be done as far as psychopharmacology is concerned with patients who have substance abuse disorders. There's antabuse, disulfiram, which is a medication that if a person drinks while they're taking it, they will feel like they're dying. Um, it's pretty complicated, and most people don't want to take it because if they're going to drink, they're not going to want to feel like they're dying. But for a patient who takes antabuse that has the tiniest sip of kiddush, they'll feel like they have the worst hangover of their life within a few hours. Antabuse is a great medication for a motivated patient or with a motivated spouse who's going to kick out that unmotivated patient that makes them take the medicine on a daily basis. There are other medications out there. There's naltrexone. There's Campro. There's also gabapentin, which is a medication that's not used too commonly here, but has good evidence in helping people to decrease their substance use. For patients who have opiate abuse, we use Percocets pills. There's Suboxone and Methadone. Methadone doesn't really help anybody do anything except get hooked on Methadone and make money from selling Methadone. But Suboxone is a great treatment. I'm sorry, there are some people who do get help by Methadone. Uh, anybody have? Okay. Uh, suboxone is a great treatment. Suboxone is buprenorphine, and this is a medication that makes it impossible for people to use opiates because it works so well at binding to the receptors that people who use heroin while they're using buprenorphine as prescribed won't even get high on it. People who use buprenorphine can't overdose on it because it stops making them tired. Now, of course, there are exceptions, but as a general rule, this is a life-saving medication for many patients. This is a medication that has to be prescribed by an expert who prescribes this medication both here and in the States. Treating complex trauma, PTSD, and borderline personality disorder should only be done by Dr. Shmuel Harris. Any fans or people that work for him? No. I'm a fan. He's great. Evidence-based treatment suggests that medications are not the answer here. Dialectical behavioral therapy, mentalization treatment, and mindfulness treatment are the answers. Medications can be helpful for treating individual symptoms, nightmares, flashbacks, increased agitation, specifically SSRIs, not benzodiazepines, not antipsychotics. But the treatment is to make sure that these patients are in dialectical behavioral therapy programs. 
and education to educate their loved ones that the outbursts are not because they've done anything wrong, but rather that they need to work on validating their loved ones. Treating ADHD begins with actually knowing if the patient has ADHD or if they're just in a hider with 35 other kids and a teacher who doesn't have a teaching degree. It's very important to keep this in mind, again, because there's myelis and chesronis treatment. If you take a stimulant, you will know whether or not it worked within an hour. Yes, it's tough to find the right dose, but you will know within an hour if it worked or not. There are MOXO tests and other ways to diagnose this, but the best thing to do is to print out the Connors rating scale online and to give it to the teacher and for the parents to do it. And if this child is very high on the Connors rating scale at home, but not at school, this patient does not have ADHD. And if it's very high at school and not very high at home, then you're a victim of society. It's very important to know again that there is stimulants, which do work. For real ADHD, they will work in 75% of folks. We know that there's bupropion, wellbutrin, and also stratero. And for kids that are very out of control in their behavior, there's things like guanfacine and clonidine. Antipsychotics are not for kids with ADHD. Antipsychotics are for teachers that think this will help kids with ADHD. You like that one? Okay. It's very important to know because when you give a kid antipsychotics, they will have neurological side effects. They will gain weight. I want to just bring up another thought. Treating the Yatzer in a Bacher with psychopharmacology is usher. Rebetzin Sprung's husband, and I have discussed this at length with Rabbi Asher Weishlita, and giving a Bacher psychopharmacology because he's in puberty or post-puberty is not an answer. We have to keep this in mind because the number of Bahrain who have been given SSRIs and even antipsychotics is profound. And a very famous doctor almost lost his license and should have for giving an antipsychotic to a Bahrain who ended up developing gynecomastia. You can Google that if you don't know what it is. But it was a severe side effect and it was not indicated in the treatment of a Bacher who is interested in looking at magazines. That's not a psychiatric illness. That is a normal behavior in some people and a spiritual problem in others. With this in mind, I want to make sure that we leave time for questions. And also, I want to apologize because, again, this discussion was supposed to start at 7.30, but I'll blame Mendel for saying it could start at 8. And furthermore, this is a year-long seminar, uh, seminar that meets twice a week for an hour and a half for PhD students. So the fact that we made it happen in about 55 minutes, where I wasted at least 10 minutes with not funny jokes, is pretty heroic. It's been an honor, and please, if I don't know you, be in touch. I'd be happy to get to know you, except for that guy. Thank you. Do it. How do you deal with issues of disclosure as a therapist? Uh, HIPAA is not as intense in Israel as it is in America, but you really shouldn't talk to uh, anybody unless you've discussed it with your patient. La Chilo, you should have your patient sign a release that says it's okay for you to talk with said person. Furthermore, said person might not want to talk with you because they might say, I don't have a release. The MS is, if you develop a relationship with a psychiatrist, you might refer some of your patients to that psychiatrist. And I might know this is 
Yitzi Silver's patient because he referred him to me. So when I meet the patient and I say, ah, you came in from Yitzi Silver, I'm going to be in touch with him. That's okay with you? Yes, I write down expressed verbal permission has been acquired. Some people are greater sticklers for this, and I think it depends on an individual's comfort level, which people are involved, but ideally you will have in your office, as one of many handouts, uh, a expressed uh, permission to speak with other people, whether it's family members or whether it's other clinicians. I know that when I have people come to me as part of their intake form, uh, when they don't just show up in my office, uh, I have them uh, sign who are the people that I'm allowed to speak with. And specifically, I write, if you have any loved ones, spouses, children, parents, rabbis, therapists, it's helpful for me to speak with them in order to help you the best. So I hope that answers your question. But if your patient's going to a psychiatrist, and they say, I don't want you to talk to him. I don't want you to talk to her. Your response to that is, we're going to try and work as a team to help you out. And it's really hard for me to catch a pass when I have a blindfold on. But Mendel. psychotherapy group for men that want to talk about their own personal development. Uh, this is a paid advertisement. Uh, what is the importance of family therapy, specifically in the treatment of minors where medications are being prescribed? The answer is prime. Because if people have stigma, and if people find bad information on the internet or from their neighbor, or from wherever they might have found it, they will interfere in the treatment process. And most people are good people and really want to help their loved ones and are just doing the best that they can to ensure that their loved ones get high quality care. And if we're all sitting together in the same room and doing psychoeducation, which I think is the most important thing that can be done then people will have good answers. This goes both for patients who think that medications aren't going to help them when they have mom or dad saying, why would you take a medication? Don't that, you know that that's us, or don't you know that that means you don't have a MUNA? Don't you know that's not going to help you? But also for patients who have parents that say, if he takes Risperdal, he'll be fine, and he'll be back at Yeshiva, and he'll be learning, and he's ready to get married in a week. It's important for us to be realistic. It's important for us to have good, open, honest discussions. If we're not doing that, we're not doing a good job. Most psychiatrists will be very happy for you to come to the meeting with the patient. Most psychiatrists will be happy to phone you in during the meeting with the patient. I think family therapy is critical, and I think the only barrier to family therapy is time. And as therapists, it's so important for you to value your own time to prevent your burnout, because we deal with very tough, heartbreaking cases. We deal with suicidality. We deal with kids going off the derech. We deal with abuse, with domestic violence, and other things that are tough to swallow. And you need to make your hours. And if you have family members that are coming in to talk to you about patients, you need to make sure that they book a time so that way you can give them 100% of your attention. Does that answer it, Mendel? So, yes, very important. You guys can thumb wrestle for who gets all three of you can thumb wrestle or play rock, paper, scissors. The three of you guys are sitting next to each other, so. Is it Yankee Goldschmidt? What is that? Is it Yankee Goldschmidt? I have no idea who Yankee Goldschmidt is. Sure. 
Neither do I. I'm sorry. Maybe. Uh, so, so uh, what is the mouth swab or the blood test that you can take that will help your doctor to find out what is the appropriate medicine for you? Does such thing exist? What, what is it? So it definitely exists. The question is, does it work? Uh, and then the other question is, if it does work, does it work well enough to justify spending five, ten, twenty-five thousand dollars for it. So the answer is uh, there is uh, one FDA approved product I believe right now called GeneSight and this is a mouth swab or a blood test. There's a few others uh, that if you take it, it will tell you that your body processes some drugs better than others. It does not give a diagnosis. It does not tell you this medication is going to work well. It just says this medication will not be processed too fast or too slow in your body as a general rule. Um, I was paid a lot of money by a Chinese company that's trying to do this and they wanted me to tell them how to do it and I told them don't because it doesn't work very well and why would anybody pay you $10,000 to do this when your study shows that after three years you can save $100 your patients. So if you own Kaiser Permanente, it might be worthwhile, but if you don't, it's not really worthwhile to do this test. If a patient has taken 500 different medicines and nothing has worked, you could probably tell me that this is a reasonable idea. If this is a patient that's doing well on treatment or has not started treatment, it's not the standard of care, and they're going to pay out of pocket for it, and it's pretty unnecessary, because it doesn't say this is going to work better, it just says these ones will be processed by the liver, not as well. If it worked really well, the FDA would mandate it. Medicare would mandate it. But instead, they're trying to lobby guys like me to call Medicare. And I told them I would. But I did take their Chinese money <laughs> and bought stretch tickets. Oh man, I'm killing Ari. Most of the time, by the end, I just start saying ridiculous things to see if I can get Ari to fall out of his chair. Okay, what, uh, stripes. Okay, first of all, I just want to tell you that your jokes are not bad. Oh, man, can we get that? Is this being taped? I'm going to send this to my wife. Okay, I'm sorry. My jokes are not bad! Woo! SNRIs. Uh, so the question is, what are SNRIs? <coughs> so uh, I, I mentioned briefly, there's Venla venlafaxine, there's Cymbalto duloxetine. Um, uh, selective serotonin and nor uh, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So theoretically, for people who have not responded well to an SSRI, they just haven't gotten enough of a benefit, these might be good medications for them because they involve uh, an extra set of neurotransmitters. Uh, Cymbalta and Benlafaxine are probably more helpful in patients who have chronic pain problems in addition to depression. Um, Venlafaxine is not a great medication because if a patient wants to come off of it, they'll experience all sorts of weird withdrawal stuff, uh, specifically weird stuff called Lermite syndrome where they get electric shocks down their spine and other not fun stuff. Uh, Cymbalta is again a good drug for chronic pain problems and depression when they run together and most people with chronic pain are feeling kind of depressed. Okay. Uh, is there a class, Dr. Flashman, on motivational interviewing at Nive? Uh, yeah. Should be. That's number one. Uh, how do you convince people to do stuff that they don't want to? Motivational interviewing. She wants to know what your sales pitch is. Motivational interviewing. 
My sales pitch is whatever the patient thinks. The MS is by the time somebody walks into my office, for whatever reason, they have a motivation to change something. And they have a problem. By the time you've walked in, you've wasted money and time. So therefore, there's some kind of problem. Even if it's my wife thinks I have a problem, or I just got fired again, or I have to be in here in order to get my driver's license. There is some kind of problem. And it doesn't matter that I think a patient has schizophrenia, violence problems, delusional problems, difficulty getting out of the house because they have OCD in the morning, difficulty being an effective spouse, child, parent, loved one, neighbor, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter why I think Mr. O'Leary has a drinking problem, because Mr. O'Leary has four DUIs, but he also has the phone number for a taxi company. Mr. O'Leary is on his third wife, and there's been a lot of domestic violence, but he just met a nice girl at the pub. Mr. O'Leary has liver cirrhosis, but so did Mickey Mantle, and he'll get a liver transplant. Mr. O'Leary just got kicked out of his housing, but he has a good couch to crash on. But Mr. O'Leary is very upset that his dog threw up on the rug because he was intoxicated last night and his dog ate too much dog food. And he's very upset that his dog threw up. So he has a problem which is that his dog threw up. And if he doesn't drink so much, then he won't pass out on the floor, and his dog won't eat too much, and then it won't throw up. And that's a good way to solve his problem. It doesn't matter that he needs a liver transplant, can't drive, is going to jail, divorce times three, and doesn't have work or a place to stay. It matters that his dog threw up. So we have to think about how we can find that vomity dog in all of our patients and loved ones. Does that answer your question? <laughs> it also works at home. On one hand, you want me to take out the trash. On the other hand, I always forget to put in a trash bag, and that's a big problem. Wouldn't it be easier if you just... Never mind. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's been real. <laughs> Go ahead, one more. Extra five shekel. Got to buy you out. Risperdal. Risperdal. Yep. What are the antipsychotics that are overprescribed in children? The answer is all of them. Uh, and, but specifically Risperdal, uh, Abilify, Seroquel. These are medications that are big criminals. But the answer is all of them. There's really no reason to prescribe an antipsychotic to somebody who isn't a person suffering from severe bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or a violent criminal who has both.